So uh, welcome everyone. We uh, seem to have passed the 50 mark on attendees. So uh, we'll just go ahead. Um, welcome to this Climate Week New York City event, uh, co-organized with the Columbia Climate School. Um, my name is Bob Chen. I'm director of one of the centers in the Climate School called SEASON, the Center for International Earth Science Information Network. Uh, we're a center that uh, uh, has been at Columbia since 1998. We're actually based at the Lamont campus of Columbia University in Palisades, New York. Uh, but of course, uh, like many groups, we've been mostly operating remotely over the past year or so. And I'm joined today by three panelists, all associated with SEASON. Uh, the first panelist is Dr. Cascade Tuholsky, who is a Earth Institute fellow, a postdoctoral scientist uh, hosted by SEASON. Um, Dr. Carolyn Holtquist, who is a postdoc here, who uh, also works with scientists at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. And uh, Dr. Alex Desherbinen, who is Associate Director for Science Applications and a Senior Research Scientist with CESA. So these three panelists are gonna be talking about different aspects of uh, climate change impacts and, and risks. Um, and we will, uh, uh, I'll it to very briefly introduce the topic and then let each of the panelists uh, speak uh, give you a short presentation for hopefully about 10 minutes max, which should leave us uh, hopefully over half the time or about half the time we have for questions and discussion. So let me uh, try to advance this. Uh, oh, and before I get into it, um, uh, if you do have questions, uh, please use the Q&A function. Uh, the chat will just go to hosts and panelists. Uh, if you do have, um, you know, uh, a technical issue, you can uh, post to that, but uh, uh, it's not going to go to everyone. Uh, we uh, will, after the presentations, uh, start uh, following the uh, the questions, I think the upvoting is available. So if uh, uh, if that's the case, you'll be able to kind of highlight the questions that you see and we'll try to put them up in the queue in terms of the ones we uh, can fit in and try and address the questions that people uh, most wanna hear responses to. Uh, and when you do put in your question, do address it either to an individual or uh, potentially say, ask everyone, but, uh, you know, try to keep those uh, short and to the point. Uh, okay, so uh, again, welcome to this uh, panel, which, uh, of course, Climate Week itself is very timely and uh, I think our focus on impacts is timely on a couple dimensions. Uh, as I'm sure you uh, have heard through the news and other sources, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, recently issued uh, the first in the series of reports uh, that are part of something called the Sixth Assessment or AR6. Uh, the first report is by Working Group One, which focuses on the physical science basis for climate change. There are actually several other groups still working on reports, um, one of which will focus on impacts um, and then others on uh, mitigation and policy issues. Um, but I think the news that uh, you of course have heard and ties in with current events, uh, unfortunately, is uh, certainly the point that um, is made here that uh, uh, the, the very first high level uh, point that's made in the report is that it's unequivocal that uh, people have uh, 
uh, warm the atmosphere, ocean, and land, and that we are seeing uh, these widespread and rapid changes affecting weather and climate extremes in every region. Um, and there's clear evidence of these uh, changes in extremes, particularly looking at things like heat waves, uh, heavy precipitation and events that lead to flooding, uh, droughts, tropical cyclones, and so forth. Obviously, there's a lot more detail in the report, but the high level message is that it's, there's really no scientific uh, basis for anything other than saying climate change is upon us, it was caused by people, and it's already having important effects. Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, when the report was released, the UN Secretary General, uh, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, made a comment which got a, play, a lot of play and is reflected in the title of our panel, which is that uh, it's the report is a code red for humanity and uh, you know emphasizing the uh, the evidence and the uh, issue that billions of people are already at risk from climate change um, and again you don't have to uh, uh, you don't have to uh, uh, you know, you just have to read the news to see the many ways in which extremes seem to be coming uh, more frequent and uh, more severe. Uh, but scientists are looking in more depth at that issue, and that's part of what we'll talk about today. So uh, again, the three presentations uh, are focused on, on not all the risks, obviously, discussed in uh, the IPCC reports, but uh, three important ones. Uh, Cascade Tucholsky, who uh, uh, completed his degree in geography from the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, uh, looking at this issue of mapping global urban extreme heat exposure. Um, Carolyn Holtquist, who is a PhD in geography from Penn State University, who will be looking at uh, bringing vulnerable populations into the flood risk equation. And Alex Desherbinen, who will talk about climate impacts, vulnerability, migration, and displacement, uh, building on um, some work he'll tell you about in collaboration with um, the World Bank and, and other partners. Um, once we do that, we'll have the question and discussion period. Uh, so just before I uh, shift over to Cascade, uh, uh, I just did want to point out one thing, which is we will be talking about a number of data sources that are the basis for uh, much of the work we do, uh, both on the climate in general, but, but uh, for season in general. Uh, much of the data that we do uh, produce or work with is made available through the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center, uh, which season runs. Uh, some of it's still in process, but uh, if, if it's not there already. Um, one of the things CDAC does do is work closely with the IPCC, which has a uh, multinationally run data distribution center. And that has worked uh, for really over uh, 20 years with uh, the assessment reports and the, the technical support units that run the different uh, working groups of the IPCC to make sure that the data that's produced as part of the assessments, the key data are made available from assessment to assessment and to the wider public. So we are continuing to work now with um, uh, the assessment report, the six assessment groups uh, to make data available uh, won't be available right away, it can only be released at some point after the reports are released. Um, but that is a, a resource that um, we've been working with or, or supporting for, for many years. And you'll also find uh, lots of other climate-related data. There's uh, uh, 
we've done work with um, what we call the low elevation coastal zone uh, data, combining topography and population and other data sets. Uh, that's their number of data sets at CDAC. Uh, lots of data on population distribution around the world, infrastructure, climate vulnerability indicators, agriculture and food security data, and other types of data that may be of interest if you're doing research or looking for sources of uh, information about specific climate. Uh, so with that, I think I will pass it to Cascade and uh, so I can get to the right button, stop sharing. So uh, thanks to everyone. If you have uh, uh, questions, we'll try to post information in the chat. Uh, I see the link to CDAC, thank you. And uh, again, post questions as you go along. We'll try to monitor it as we go. So Cascade, uh, I'll stop sharing and you can go ahead. All right, thanks, Bob. Get my slides up here for everyone. Let me take a second. Um, all right. Um, are my slides up? Uh, everyone can see them? Yes. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, as Bob said, my name is Cascade Jaholski. I'm a postdoctoral research scientist um, uh, working with Season, and I'm really excited to be here today to present at uh, Climate Week New York City um, and talk about some work that I've been developing with um, scholars from around the world. And um, just a caveat that the work I'm presenting today is actually embargoed. Um, the publication should be released very soon. So the data set and the code, the publication will come out um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, but because of that, I can't go into too many specifics in terms of our key findings. So I just want to give that as a caveat up front. But my talk today is um, basically an overview of how we're mapping global urban extreme heat exposure um, with the hope to reduce harm um, from extreme heat in uh, urban centers around the world. So a bit of terminology just to um, introduce some language to the audience and apologies if you're already familiar with these terms, but um, a simple way to understand how climate change impacts not just people but ecosystems as well is um, basically a hazard vulnerability exposure framework. So the hazard is the probability that an event will happen. So hazards can go up, um, an earthquake, or we'll, we'll use extreme heat here. Ex the likelihood of extreme heat events globally is going up. Um, exposure intersects the hazard with the population or the infrastructure or asset or ecosystem being exposed. So that's the, the likelihood of the event multiplied by, uh, we'll say population in this case, urban population. Um, vulnerability is defined as the susceptibility to harm from exposure without the capacity to adapt. Um, and then kind of umbrella thing, uh, in an umbrella around all of that is um, socioeconomic resilience. And that um, speaks right to the notion of adaptive capacity. So uh, my talk um, particularly focuses on the exposure aspect. So the, the hazard times the population, my data set doesn't quite div dive into vulnerability. And I'll speak to that um, in a bit more detail uh, as the talk goes on. So those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, um, specifically in the Northwest, um, learned in a really harsh and I would say horrific reality of what um, extreme heat, specifically in urban areas, can do to human health and well-being. Um, everything from occupational heat hazards to increased mortality to damage infrastructure. Um, with implications for food security, um, but also direct effects on neonatal health, maternal, um, as well as maternal and child health outcomes. Um, and I would argue that uh, extreme heat, this is kind of cliche, but in a sense is a silent killer, um, is specifically for economic well being. That uh, for people who work outside, who work in areas without access to um, extreme or to you know, air conditioning, extreme heat can reduce economic livelihoods, which I would argue um, can increase um, likelihood of being kind of trapped in cycles of poverty, um, which ultimately affects, uh, you know, human health and well-being, aside from just the acute, you know, uh, health damage from heat stroke or uh, mortality, things like that. Oops, pardon me. Um, 
What hasn't been shown um, and is really poorly understood specifically for urban areas is how uh, much, you know, what is the impact of extreme heat on urban population worldwide? And I would argue that a big part of that is we've really lacked data. Um, the left panel is a bar chart from a paper that um, actually um, just got uh, revisions back um, that shows that about 3 billion urban or peri-urban, so folks who live on the peripheries of cities, uh, live more than 25 kilometers away from a weather station. So in India, in the right panel, um, the green represents where there are about 3,000 urban settlements in India, and only 111 of those settlements have a weather station with a long-term reliable record. So for much of the planet, you can't necessarily even look up, you know, the current weather conditions with much accuracy, and especially in urban areas, temperature can vary greatly over very short distances. Um, much less look at how extreme heat has changed over time. There's a great paper, I believe, in Nature Communications that just came out that showed from 1990 until today in the official hazard data record for the continent of Africa, there have been two official heat waves, which we know intuitively is not correct. So the impacts of extreme heat really have not been studied and detailed for much of the most rapid urbanizing places on the planet. Thankfully, um, a group, uh, many groups have uh, contributed to this, but um, there are new data sets coming online that leverage the satellite a meteorological record and the station observation record to build algorithms that can um, identify daily temperature signals for places of the planet where we don't have a good station observation. The data set I use was produced by the University of California, Santa Barbara Climate Hazard Center. It's called Church Daily. It just came out last year and it is the most accurate and high resolution daily global temperature product produced to date, specifically designed to look at maximum temperatures, so daily maximum temperatures. So in the panel um, on the right, in green is the correlation between um, the Church uh, data set and station observations versus the Princeton Global Forcing data set, which is another wonderful uh, data set produced in, I believe, the early 2000s. Um, and Schertz really improves on what the Princeton data set first set out to do in terms of producing a very accurate um, extreme heat um, measurement. So um, again, I'm talking about exposure and I wanna introduce a bit more of my terminology and methods here. So um, the extreme heat metric we're using, which has been getting a lot more attention in the media, uh, which I think is crucial for the general public to understand, is a combination of air temperature and humidity. Um, in terms of health impacts, it's really a mixture of whether of air temperature and humidity um, in terms of uh, reducing uh, labor output or impact negatively impacting health, uh, health because at some point, uh, once certain humidity thresholds are achieved, the advantages our body gets from sweating pretty much decrease um, to the point where our, we don't get much evaporative cooling benefit from sweating. So in the data set uh, I built, I constructed a heat index, which is commonly used in the United States for kind of how it feels outside. And I also approximated a wet bulb globe temperature, which is a more complex measurement of how it feels that accounts for wind speed and then radiative uh, heating. So if you're standing you know, on asphalt versus grass. Um, so for this data set um, to walk through the panels, we take the daily maximum heat index, we intersect it with our urban uh, settlement boundaries we come up with a daily maximum area average um, heat index value or wet bulb globe value for each of these cities. Then to measure exposure, we take the number of days per year where a threshold is exceeded and multiply it by the number of people exposed. So over time, if the number of people goes up being exposed, but the heating days stays the same, we'll have an increase in exposure, vice versa, this is a good example from Europe where urban populations really aren't growing. If populations are stable and heating days goes up, exposure will increase. For most cities, it's a combination of both population growing up and heating days exposure. An important thing about this analysis to emphasize is at least with this first um, cut, we do not back out the contribution from climate change versus the urban heat ion effect to total warming. Um, 
So what we produce is an observational record of about 150 million data points for 13,000 cities on the planet. And we can look for each individual city, how that exposure trajectory is changing over time and whether it's population or heating that is contributing to that growth and exposure. In terms of geographical pattern, as we would expect, countries or areas of the planet that have rapid urban population growth and rapid warming tend to have the greatest uh, increases in exposure. And this comes back to my hypothesis in terms of impacts on urban poverty that I think the, what our results can help understand is how extreme heat ultimately are impacting urban poor and whether people moving to and being born into cities today get the economic gains that are historically been associated with urban or with urbanization. So again, we can look at the independent signal of population growth versus warming. And we see specific for India that are many cities on the planet that have steep population trajectories, but still the signal from warming is so great um, that it is, I guess, outpacing the impact of more people moving to cities and more people being born into cities. A final point I want to make that's really cool about this data set, and I'm really excited for it to be released publicly, is that geography really matters, place matters. Seemingly city cities can, similar cities can have different drivers of exposure. So Delhi and Kolkata um, are large Indian uh, cities. I think both of them have populations in excess of 10 million people. And if we just look at exposure, their trajectories are fairly congruent since the early 1980s. But we see that in Delhi, the trend due to population growth versus warming is different. Um, Kolkata has a much stronger warming signal. So for local adaptations, it's important for people to start, under, uh, start assessing whether they need to prepare for more warming or for more people or both. With that, um, I look forward to your questions. And I'm again, I'm really thankful for everyone to be here today. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Cascade. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, yeah, it's it's too bad that uh, uh, it's sort of a teaser for your paper coming out that uh, people have to uh, come back and see more. But uh, we're glad you were able to kind of give an overview of of the issues and <clears throat> how you're doing the analysis. So our second uh, speaker is Carolyn Holtquist. Carolyn. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be discussing aspects of vulnerability, particularly in relation to flooding. Um, and I think this is a really important question as we consider how finer resolution data and more information about vulnerable populations can be brought in so that we can better anticipate and assess risks and also help with policy and management to that effect. So the first project I wanted to discuss with you is uh, related to climate justice metrics. This work was done with Marco Tedesco, who's at the Lamont um, Laboratory. And we were reflecting a lot on how census data often capture single variables. However, when you look at the intersection of multiple variables, you can start seeing patterns and trends in relationship to the individuals that are affected. And it can be really important to capture inequalities, particularly when you have heterogeneous communities within census tract units. So this is an example from Miami where we show how we can bring together multiple different data sets related to socioeconomic, physical risk, and housing data um, from the area. And the housing data that we're able to bring in also has breakdowns by racial components so that we can understand how much race um, is influencing factors related to mortgaging, mortgages and evictions, um, and also see some of these effects over time. So you'll notice here that we have a comparison between two different areas of Miami. Um, Biscayne is more of a um, wealthier area and Little River has more poverty. And from the first panel, you can see that we have this breakdown in the percentages where you have um, over multiple different years from the ACS survey that we're able to um, 
look at um, poverty, unemployment, minority, traditional things that we're able to find um, within the within the ACS or the census data, the American Community Survey that's done. And this American Community Survey allows us to fill some of those gaps between um, the decadal census. So we're able to have some temporal resolution, but one of the benefits of bringing in other sort of data sets such as housing is that we can have data at a finer temporal resolution. So here we broke it down by annual. So if you see in the lower plots, um, we have like an annual um, breakdown of people that are applying for loans um, by race and who, who is denied those loans. And we can kind of look at these changes over time to understand how their socioeconomic impacts. And one of the things that we're developing off of this project, which is under review right now, is using this data for capturing climate gentrification processes in Miami. And I think it's really important that we look at this more nuanced data and see what other data sets that we can integrate um, in order to more appropriately capture vulnerable populations at a really high temporal resolution. So next, I want to mention um, the CDC, Social Vulnerability Index, which hopefully many of you are already familiar with. Um, the CDC um, index um, is produced at both the county and the tract level. So um, the tract level is smaller than the county level is higher resolution. Um, and they're really intended to indicate these relatively higher levels of social disparities and be used for hazards and for um, helping to respond or recover from disaster. These indices are made by combining different factors. The SVI, the Social Vulnerability Index from the CDC, um, has four different main categories and incorporates um, individual variables from these different categories, as you can see here. And we wanted to take this data set a step further so that we can better assess um, the vulnerable populations and exactly where they are. Um, so we did a step here, which is pretty straightforward, but we have these um, tract level variables that you see on the left hand panel. And these are the social vulnerability um, tracks for 2018. And this is the overall value that was calculated by combining all of those categories. And we use a mask and we remove areas where there's water and where there's areas without populations so that we can clip it down. And you actually see that it removes quite a lot of um, regions. Um, and this can help to be helpful to um, calculate exposure more accurately. Um, a number of methods that I've seen often will calculate the area of a track that's been exposed to flooding. Um, but they not, not, not actually consider where the population is exposed to or is exposed there, um, or if it's just the percentage of the track. And some of the track might already be water or be areas without population. So hopefully this data set will be um, useful for people to um, better inform those calculations. Um, and then we, I wanna show you these maps. So this is an example of the overall score. Um, that's available at CDAC. Uh, and you can um, use this layer um, directly. And then you also have available for you these other four categories. So we have the socioeconomic only by itself, the household and disability score, the minority status and language score, and the housing and transportation score all separately. And you'll see that sometimes um, they coincide as having um, the most effects and other times they don't. And this allows some flexibility um, between uh, using these different scores um, when it's the most appropriate for um, the implementation. So for example, if you're trying to communicate uh, related to a hazard or an early warning, it might be good to look at the language score and the minority status or things like that. So you might be able to um, better inform your decision-making processes. Um, and there's many different examples we could look at um, for each of these um, subsets. Um, and this is um, work that's continuing to be done um, with uh, actually the, everyone on, the, on this um, panel um, to use or to provide a case study using these um, grids um, in relationship to climate risks. And then I also want to mention to you this data set um, that's being produced. Um, it is
a multi-dimensional poverty index, which is also at the grid level, and it's going to be provided globally. And it combines a number of different um, factors from wealth, um, using night light data, um, footprints of where buildings are, and infant mortality rates and other sort of demographic characteristics in order to create a relative um, poverty index. Um, and this is ongoing work um, that has been being tested out in a few different countries right now and should be available globally soon. And in general, this could be used in a similar way to the SVI grading that I mentioned before of capturing this relative vulnerability. And then next to last, I wanna mention this data set. So this is the global flood risk grid. Um, and it was, it's a combination of a few different layers um, in order to intersect where there's the highest vulnerability and the highest exposure. Um, in the same area. So this is kind of a test out area here of trying to explain what's happening in the data sets. So we have the EF5 layer, which is a flash flood hazard layer. And that's the orange that you see here of the probability of flash flooding, sort of like Cascade was talking about is a lot of times the hazard is calculated by a probability. But a lot of times we see the impacts. If you notice these green dots here, which is provided by this impact data set that you can have access to here, um, led by Agat Sherry. And you can see that a lot of times the impacts align with this purple layer here of where the populations are. This is for Quito, Ecuador, um, and also the outskirts of the city here um, using the high resolution settlement layer, which is also provided by CDAC. And so we use this as a way to test out if the model is performing properly, and if it is impact, if the impacts are actually associated with where the populations are, which you can see that they are. And we use it to refine the model because a lot of time from the flood hazard layer, you'll have the hazard, um, but you might not have the information about who's exposed. And so we combine it with this multi-dimensional poverty index that you see in the top right corner in order to create this layer in the bottom right where you have high uh, flash flood probability combined with high, um, high uh, vulnerability. In order to see here this brown layer where you have um, the, the combination of the two. And I think this is really a way that we need to continue to move where we're integrating multiple different layers in order to make more informed decisions. And this is gonna be used in part, as part of an early action protocol for flash flooding in Ecuador with the Red Cross um, in partnership with Andrew Krushewitz. And then finally, I wanna mention a collaboration uh, with Lehman College. And this is to produce um, building level vulnerability. And so we actually use Quito Ecuador for the same, as the same, as the same example uh, for a case study. Um, we're also producing this for a number of other cities and we're collecting uh, data within the city's areas and ca capturing variables using a crowdsource-based based method called mechanical turking. And we capture a number of variables related um, to vulnerability, uh, to flooding, uh, using Google Street View and remote sensing imagery. And then we're using that as a training data set in order to produce um, layers at the urban level. And so this work is ongoing, um, but there's a conference paper that was published recently um, with these wonderful students. And so I hope you take a look at it. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Great uh, overview of uh, quite a few different activities uh, focused on on this overall issue of uh, trying to map and identify who's vulnerable and, and how vulnerable they are. Uh, so our, our third presentation uh, is by Alex de Sherbinen. Thanks, Bob, appreciate it. And really uh, great to share, share the stage with my colleagues. It's uh, terrific work. Um, I'm gonna just make this a little bigger so everyone can see it. Sorry, I do 
This thing is in the way. Move it away. Swap. Yeah, I, it's not moving. There we go. There we go. All right. Here we are. So thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'll be talking a bit about climate impacts, vulnerability, and migration and displacement, which can more broadly be grouped into the term mobility. And so I'll just jump right into it. Um, uh, like Cascade, I thought a little background might be useful. So he talked about vulnerability uh, as, a, as an approach or a theory. Um, there's also theories of migration that go back to the 19th century, in fact. So Ravenstein came up with this law of migration, which looks at uh, push and pull factors. Some of you may have heard this kind of terminology before. So there's a mix of positive and negative things in both the places, the source areas and the destination areas. And there are these things that are called intervening obstacles like borders, <laughs> for instance. Uh, bus tickets may represent an obstacle for some people if the cost is too high or a flight. Visas, other things that essentially make it difficult to get from point A to point B. Um, and so uh, typically there's a mix of positive and negative things in each place, but when the positives in the destination area tend to outnumber the negatives in the source areas, uh, people have a tendency to move. Um, and migration tends to increase over time. Uh, so that means there's a certain momentum to migration. You can imagine when you have a diaspora community in, a, in the destination area, uh, that it's much easier to stay with an uncle or aunt or uh, a friend um, and get yourself established in the destination area um, if you have that kind of diaspora. Uh, migration is selective, so not everybody tends to migrate. The young, the able, uh, particularly males, tend to migrate slightly more than females, so that depends on the location. Uh, elderly tend to stay in place, and young children obviously tend to only migrate if their parents migrate, although we're increasingly, of course, seeing unaccompanied minors um, uh, in Central America. Economic motives tend to dominate. Uh, so bear that in mind as I talk about climate impacts because generally speaking, those kinds of impacts like climate change will tend to work through the economic channel. Uh, there ten tend to be three dimensions to migration, space, time, and volition. So you have uh, the distance that people move, you have the actual amount of time they stay where they go. And you know, it may be that if it's only a couple of days, that would not call qualify as as migration so much as a visit or, or business trip. And volition has to do with the degree to which people are able to choose whether or not to migrate. And this all gets into the question of mobility types. So there's uh, the, the, the big difference between internal and international migration. Internal migration tends to be about 95% of total mobility internationally. Uh, sorry, internal migration is 95%. Is international migration is about 5%. Uh, more or less. Um, total migration globally, internationally is about 3% of the global population and that percentage has remained pretty consistent over time. Types of mobility, short term, circular, seasonal, uh, you have short versus long distance moves, uh, rural or urban, which is obviously very prevalent in developing countries, but increasingly with COVID, you've had urban to rural moves with uh, depopulation of some cities. You have force versus voluntary, and you have all these other types like trade and pastoralism and tourism. And so we like to think of um, uh, mobility as being on a spectrum from a uh, kind of situations where people are very highly vulnerable and, and because of various stressors are likely to dis be displaced or move un involuntarily. Um, we call it distress migration in some cases uh, to you know place, places where it's sort of a mix of factors and environmental factors may play some role to situations where people really are not vulnerable at all and they tend to be able to choose when they wanna move, where they wanna move. Many of you on this call probably decided where you're gonna to go to college, where you're gonna get your first job. And those are all things that we chose to do because we had the uh, means to do so. Um, this diagram helps to explain how this intersection between environmental hazards, which I'll talk a little bit more in a moment, uh, and social vulnerability, which is really the, the individual characteristics. Um, Carolyn talked about you know, uh, language capabilities, age, gender, uh, educational status, uh, things like that that affect the degree to which we can cope with stressors. And the intersection tends to produce risk and people may move under certain circumstances 
Uh, but there may be other things that uh, mitigating factors that may affect the degree to which people move. So if a government has a strong response or institutional capacity, or you have a FEMA or other agency come in and, and, and make things better for a population that's been affected by a stressor, uh, or if there's agricultural insurance or the government comes in and buys out the crops or pays farmers for, for losses in crops, they're much more likely to continue to farm or much likely to, more likely to stay in place. Um, if you have past experience with migration as a risk reduction strategy, that may give you more options. If there's other types of responses such as improved seed varieties or um, flood barriers or things like that that may actually help you to stay where you are, then those are all a factor into your decision making. And then people have their own individual perceptions. And what we find is often perceptions of environmental change may be more important than actual instrumental record. Uh, people think it's just getting hotter or more disagreeable in a location that may have uh, as much of an impact as, um, as what the actual MET station data says from, from that location. And so we have these different mobility responses related to different types of stressors. And basically on the bottom kind of rapid onset or fast onset events and at the top more slow onset creeping changes in the environment. And um, you also have sort of the, the likelihood level of um, long-term migratory response uh, in the final column here. And basically where you have like longer term secular changes, things are just getting worse in a location over time. There's probably a higher certainty there'll be some kind of long-term migratory response. Whereas uh, what we see in the case of extreme weather events is uh, generally that people are displaced and return. Although it's very true that if you have multiple extreme weather events in succession, uh, let's say over several years, that uh, household assets could be depleted to the point um, where uh, the decision to migrate uh, becomes more attractive. Uh, another sort of stylized finding from the research is that people tend to move in a differential way depending on their income levels. So at the very low income levels, people may not be able to move at all because they're trapped. Uh, we found in the literature that very small amounts of aid or assistance or very small increases in, in uh, income can actually significantly change the likelihood that at least one member of a household will move. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you have very well, more or better off or relatively wealthy people who may have businesses, they may be landowners, they may have a lot of reasons why they wanna stay in a location. So they tend to be on this end and migration levels again, tend to be low in that area. One of the risks that we may see in the future is that with growing impacts, uh, we may see increasing distress migration. Um, so this is something that um, I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, but colleagues and I worked on a paper recently for science uh, and you can access the paper or contact me directly if you want the paper. And basically we look at some of these issues of habitability and migration. And these are some of the sort of longer term drivers, the slow onset things like the temperature change that uh, combinations of high temperatures and high wet bulb, uh, global temperature or high humidity that Cascade mentioned, which could have a real impact on the, the sort of even ability to survive uh, future uh, heat waves, uh, let alone kind of cope and adapt. And then you have the issue of changes in the frequency of flood events because of sea level rise going from one in a hundred year to every year to maybe multiple times per year in these blue area in these blue areas along the coast. Now there's been a lot of reporting on what might happen with uh, climate change in, in uh, especially transboundary movements, this idea of climate refugees. Uh, the literature on, on, in the research tends to be, uh, that focuses on this area tends to be largely um, focused down here in the bottom area, but there are some small amounts of research looking at pre-industrialized societies with very different technology levels and what happened to them when changes in climate occurred to more recent events such as the Dust Bowl in the 1930s in the US and Sahelian droughts. Uh, those all inform our understanding, but the more recent work tends to be very careful statistical analyses looking at changes in temperature and precipitation in relation to the probability of migrating, uh, where we control for multiple factors such as age, sex, and education levels that are known to influence migration patterns. 
field studies are also conducted where people just go to the field and ask people why they migrated or why they're planning to migrate and what those uh, drivers might be, including climate drivers. And then there's work that's more recent looking at displacement from extreme events and how major migration events may be preceded. Like in Syria, colleagues here at the Earth Institute and Climate School did some work looking at the major drought in Syria that predated the, um, predated the mass displacement and migration in the Civil War. Obviously, the Civil War was a major triggering factor. But before that, there was a lot of rural urban migration from farms to the city as the drought progressed and people became increasingly dissatisfied with the governance. So all these things came together in a very complicated way to create a civil war and ultimately uh, a lot of displacement to Europe and other countries around the region. Uh, so what we know so far from research findings is that environmental change has affected past movements and will likely do so in the future. Income is really the main driver, but environmental conditions can influence those income factors. Rural to urban migration has increased, and there's a risk that there will be trapped populations, people who cannot move. Uh, other findings include the fact that most migration is internal, as in the past, and that refugee flows will likely be mostly from the south to the south. So countries like Ethiopia will send migrants or refugees to neighboring countries like Sudan, and probably not so much to, uh, to North America or Europe. Uh, temperature and precipitation both help explain uh, these, but it varies from place to place. And so that really suggests that the economic policy, culture, and other things dominate decision-making. Uh, some planned relocation and resettlement is already occurring. We can expect more in the future. And migration as adaptation, seen as a positive thing rather than a negative thing, is a really critical concept in this domain. Some work that we did earlier looked at this issue of resettlement um, associated with climate change. We're welcome to look at that later. Um, so we've done some modeling looking at essentially the agricultural pathway for future climate-induced migration. Uh, where we look at how ecosystem dependent livelihoods, rain fed agriculture, places like uh, where pastoralism is practiced, and how they might drive migration uh, over the next two to three decades. Uh, and we look at how, you know, there's a need really to build climate resilient livelihoods in these areas. Uh, so unless these kinds of resilient livelihoods are developed, migration will likely ensue. World Bank reports that Bob mentioned earlier are the groundswell reports. Number two just came out two weeks ago, so fresh off the press. Um, and basically what the new reports show is that uh, the groundswell two shows is up to 216 million people, but as low as 48 million, depending on which emissions and development scenarios you use, could uh, migrate by 2050 across the World Bank regions that are depicted on the, in the map in the upper right. And this varies a lot by region. So in Africa, there's actually a very high proportion of migrants compared to the population there, although the population in Africa is growing rapidly. So that's also a factor. And that inevitably uh, in our modeling work, the low emission scenarios and the inclusive development scenarios, the, the better development scenarios tend to produce lower levels of total migration. So that's these bars, pessimistic, inclusive development and climate friendly on the right. And one advantage of our modeling approach is that we can actually project out and, and identify hotspots in red of places that are likely to be destination areas and in blue of places that are likely to be sending areas. Note, none of these areas are likely to lose population, especially in Africa, um, but they're likely to grow slower in those blue areas than they would otherwise uh, absent climate impacts. And so the data will soon be released by the NASA CDAC. Um, just briefly touching on the US, we can just say that if you want to use those great SOVI data, that uh, social vulnerability index data that Carolyn described earlier, there's a bunch of issues that are awaiting our attention, such as increased wildfire risk, sea level rise, drought, extreme heat. And all of these were the subject of a major conference that we held in June called the At What Point Manage Retreat Conference. Uh, and you can go online and all the presentations from that conference are now on YouTube. So you can go and look for yourself and really learn more about this issue. The, this conference in particular really focused on US and developed country climate migration issues. So um, are we, uh, do we have reason to you know, think about this and it, are these real, are, are climate migrants real? Yes, I think they are to a degree, but really what we're talking about is an increase in mixed migration, 
that there are a whole multitude of factors that result in migration occurring. We're doing a lot of work in Central America now, gang violence, uh, fear by parents of their kids getting ensnared by gangs, uh, narco trafficking, all those things are important in terms of driving uh, both the level of um, migration and also a sense of whether one has hope for the future in there in, in by staying in place. And um, one thing I always say is that migration may be one of the few forms of personal agency available to people who are really poor and who need some way of getting out of difficult circumstances. So we need to bear that in mind as we think about migrants. They're human beings and they need our protection. If you wanna learn more about some of the policy mechanisms, I was part of a task force that recently met to inform the Biden administration. You can go to that bit.ly link there in the bottom right if you wanna learn more about that work. Um, feel free to reach out to me by email and I guess we'll go over to discussion now. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Alex. Good, and we're, I'm starting to see some questions. A few have been answered uh, uh, in the Q&A box, but uh, I noticed at least one cascade, uh, you said you would comment more. So we can start opening up the discussion, uh, do you can vote on questions that are open and uh, we have, I think uh, at least 15 minutes or so to, uh, to uh, talk about these issues. So uh, Cascade, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, um, it's a really good question um, because at the end of the day, uh, uncertainty is something as scientists that we really want to quantify and explain to the general public and uh, decision makers. And so the temperature data set that we use, the Church Daily, which I posted a link to that data set and the paper, which only goes through 2016, but I think in the next few months, it will be brought up to present time, um, has been validated. And that's explained in the scientific manuscript and you can actually download the validation data. The population data sets are a bit more complex and that's another, um, Thing that I do a lot of research on with season is um, to look at uh, the population data sets are similarly built by um, blending uh, good census data and satellite observations to create an algorithm that identifies human population across the planet and validation of that work um, is ongoing by other teams. Um, and so that side of the equation is a bit unknown. And then the last thing I'll say is the relative humidity data set we built for that product um, it is based on the maximum temperature, but it has not been fully validated yet. Great. Um, Carolyn, I think you answered a question about global flood vulnerability. Anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so the global flood layer isn't available right now, um, but it, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, but there is just the US layer right now for the social vulnerability grids. And I posted the link there um, for access. Okay, uh, Alex, I think you answered a couple of questions, but uh, you may want to comment on them or one of the open ones, which was, you have several. Sure. Yeah, um, some of them just seem to be people who are doing work in allied fields, and we're happy to interact with you, you know, offline to find out more about your particular research. I know in the case of Bangladesh, there was actually a validation study that was take that done, one was done and I'll try to dig that up in a moment because um, uh, what they did is essentially looked at actual migration data within Bangladesh um, for recent periods. Um, and um, they found that the regions that we projected to increase or decrease in relation to climate uh, risks, including sea level rise, uh, which was a major one in, in Bangladesh, but also crop production and water availability were roughly the same and, and that there were some strong similarities. So I'll, um, I'll find that reference and send it in the chat. Uh, Cascade, looks like you have a couple questions about the heat index and heat. Islands and wet bulb extremes. 
Sorry, I was muted. Um, I think I can answer all the questions uh, pretty succinctly here. So the first question is um, regarding wet bulb globe. Um, and so we're using wet bulb globe temperatures, which is different than wet bulb temperatures. Um, but we did we have the results for 32 degrees C, which is like the max end of international standards organization occupational heat stress standards for a very high likelihood of extreme risk to uh, heat stress or heat related illness. And we have the data set for that, and that will be released on NASA CDEC. Um, I could very quickly also look at wet bulb globe temperatures of 35 C um, as well. And to the trajectory question, um, so all our data is point data. We have heat index or wet bulb globe temperature threshold multiplied by population for each year. And then for the trajectory, it's just a simple linear regression model. So we can look at how person days are increasing each year. Um, so that's our beta term. And that also will be available in the NASA CDEC uh, data set release um, with a full readme and explainer. So thank you for the questions. Oh, I, I don't know why I'm doing this, but uh, we seem to be rotating among the panelists. So uh, I'll skip to the question that was just posted to Carolyn about uh, explaining a bit more about climate gentrification, which I, I remember hearing that term too and wondering. <laughs> yeah, so that is um, for a publication that's currently under review. Um, and it's using a combination of these different factors, including the housing data and socioeconomic data, in order to produce a metric um, to capture gentrification. And so it's, it's a step in that direction, we hope. And it might be different in different places. Um, so some you might have different um, characteristics or thresholds, let's say. Um, but it's supposed to um, be able to be flexible uh, method a flexible methodology um, in order to produce that. And that's um, also in collaboration with Marco Tedesco um, and hopefully will be coming out in the next month or so. Great, uh, looks like Alex is getting ready to answer a couple pointed questions. <laughs> you, you yeah, uh, I saw one from Kelsey, I'll respond to that. Um, so uh, this, this is a great question. Um, my, so I think, you know, that you teed it up in a way um, for me, um, you know, obviously we need to understand why people m move. The model that we did for Groundswell was explicitly top down. Uh, it takes advantage of what one of our forte or strengths at season uh, is really in spatial population modeling and understanding, you know, macro level movements, but it is not, uh, you know, it was not kind of intended to uh, understand the local nuances of why people move in a given circumstance and uh, in a given location and the political economy and other things that may be influencing whether people choose to move or not. And so I'm aware, I'm painfully aware of the limitations of this top-down approach and uh, the agent-based modeling approach does attempt to um, essentially identify what what different classes of individuals, uh, how they perceive things, uh, the kinds of connections they may have, transfer of information between people, uh, and also their proclivities to move, um, their rootedness in essence. And those things, those models have proven, you know, whether they're effective or not, in some ways remains to be seen because. Uh, you know, there's a recent work on Bangladesh again, not to keep coming back to that, but there's the agent-based model actually showed more people moving back to the coastal zone because of opportunities there. That may well happen in the future, but because it is the future, uh, we can't inherently test it um, the way that we can a model that sort of run in a hindcast mode and goes up to the present. Then we could test these different approaches and see. I'll just say also that ABM models are, are very powerful, but also require a lot of data inputs. So I'm a big fan of them. I th think they're the way to go in the future, but um, in many regions of the world, we simply don't have the level of data um, uh, availability that would meet the requirements of those models. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, Cascade, are you queued up to... Yeah, there's a question about urban heat islands, and I think it's a really valid question that I've been thinking about 
um, a lot lately because it, uh, my work lends itself, it's the next clear spinoff with the analysis. So if my hand is a city, um, let's say the Los Angeles basin, and then there are pixels, uh, our temperature signal for daily is average across that whole city. So the question goes whether the heat island effect is increasing, you know, whether we're underestimating heat or overestimating it for a given city. And I think that's, uh, I don't have a direct answer to that question because it depends how much of that city um, has an increased urban heat island effect. Uh, again, to use the Los Angeles example, you know, you have so much green space in um, Beverly Hills. And if you include parts of Santa Monica and Malibu, versus the whole San Bernardino Valley. So I don't know if that averages out over space for the influence of the urban heat island effect, but in general, um, and then also who is most vulnerable in that city. And that's really where I'd like to go into next. Um, and I think we have the data and the analysis to dive into that. Um, uh, and another thing I'll just add to my knowledge, I don't think there've been global scale studies that have looked at the urban heat island effect in terms of heat health impacts using something that accounts for humidity as well as temp air temperature. Um, but happy to follow up um, if that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's go back to Alex. There's a highly uh, upvoted question about, oh, wait a minute, what happened to it? <laughs> Did you answer it? I just to it and in, in, uh, in uh, type the response. I can summarize it. Um, well, I think the same person had another question too. So let me just... see if I can. Uh, yeah, so there was a really good recent uh, webinar on uh, population uh, dynamics across uh, fertility, migration, et cetera. Um, that was, we co hosted actually, we ran it out of something called our Population Environment Research Network uh, and the IUSSP. And uh, I'm gonna get you the link right now, but basically uh, the question of fertility and climate change is only really beginning to be uh, investigated. And um, it's um, it, true. I mean, once people move to cities, uh, if for instance, people move from rural areas to cities, fertility will likely decline because that tends to be uh, the cost of living and things and educational opportunities make it easier for folks to you know, really make it a, a strong incentive for people to have smaller, smaller family sizes. Um, and all of these things are going to have some inter interesting interactions. One thing um, I'm going to just put uh, in my answer to you, Atik, I'm going to put the link to this webinar that I uh, just mentioned. But um, uh, Cascade and I are actually collaborating with a graduate student or an undergrad um, working on a, on a review basically What's going to happen if people leave rural areas and they move to uh, urban urban areas in terms of food security? And will climate change impact both the food security in the rural areas and in the urban areas? And are we going to see, say, depopulation of some rural areas in ways that labor availability, like you could have maybe climate impacts are going to be less of an issue than the actual labor availability. Cascades also looked at the heat impacts um, on and, and knows of literature on the heat impacts of agricultural laborers and it's fairly significant and it could actually overshadow the impacts of direct climate impacts on crops when you start getting uh, you know heat prostration and things like that in the fields. I don't know if Cascade wants to say anything more on that. Yeah, I'll just add a, one thing I'm really curious about too, in terms of this connections between mobility, food security, uh, urban livelihoods and rural livelihoods is what happens when there are geographically large heat waves that impact a food system, whether that's visibly labor or crop output, but also impact labor conditions within proximate urban centers. Um, and to my knowledge, that hasn't been investigated in detail, but I think um, given what I lived through this summer in the Northwest, that climate heat extremes are going to be much worse than I think we really fully comprehend, especially for areas with zero experience with that kind of extreme heat. Okay, well, we uh, think of, there's one open question left, although you did already talk about climate refugees, Alex, did you wanna 
have any last comment about that? Well, you know, I like to say if you're talking to your grandmother and you need to use the term climate refugees to explain what this is, and it's a good short, it helps with the shorthand, that's fine. I think that ultimately uh, this concept is being, you know, increasingly abandoned by academia because uh, we realize that A, people very rarely have no volition and, you know, zero ability to determine it. it in conflict situations, certainly that is the case. People are fleeing for their lives, but I'm actually increasingly interested in sort of theories of forced migration. Uh, what is this balance of, of, a, of will and a volition and inability to make choices? And I think we, we need to look at that more clearly. And the second real reason people are abandoning uh, refugees is uh, the concept of climate refugees is that um, this is a term that is unhelpful from a policy perspective. So to the degree that government policies like the US Immigration Service or what's now called Department of Homeland Security makes a determination about someone being in a certain category um, or not, right now there's no basis under the UN Convention on Refugees for calling someone a climate refugee. Uh, but I think what we're gonna start seeing is willingness not to entertain people under that broader you know, UN convention, which is really about human rights abuses and people fleeing dictatorial regimes and conflicts, untenable situations. There is gonna be a recognition, maybe not as a refugee, but as someone who is severely impacted by um, climate conditions in ways that return to their home country could actually constitute a violation of their rights. And we may see those kinds of court cases coming up increasingly in the future. So I don't know if that helps or hurts, but I thought I'd just add that. Yeah, and uh, I think, you know, one, one of the points is uh, that refugee in the international arena has a very specific definition given by the conventions and that conflicts with the kind of generic use of the term climate refugee when people are talking about, uh, you know, climate induced movement. So mixing those two gets very confusing. Um, we are past, we, we just have a few minutes left. One last question came in, which I'm just looking at. I guess it's a cascade question. Uh, Want to try it, cascade? Sure, yeah, This I think this is a really exciting question that I've been talking um, with one of my co-authors, Catherine Grace, a lot about um, in like very, detail over the last couple of weeks. Um, Kathy Grace is at Minnesota, University of Minnesota. And just very quickly, I think to get at that question, we need um, better monitoring on the ground. So more weather stations, whether that's personalized health devices, things like that, to understand how things are just, just how people are distributed through space um, in cities and where that co-impacts with heat. And then the second thing, um, I just think there's a lot of opportunity for new earth observation sensors. Eco stress comes to mind. I've heard rumors that some of the private satellites companies might start sending thermal infrared satellites into space. Um, and then building the modeling approaches to translate that satellite data into air temperature and humidity impacts. I really think there's a lot of opportunity and exciting space for that. So thanks for that question. And another question came in. It looks like you're answering yeah, I was that. Alex. Typing an answer, but then it disappeared on me. So I can't <laughs> okay. I will just oh, this will be the last one. Yeah. Then, then, then Kat's question actually embeds the answer, which is yes, it'll be a combination. Here's what I would say. Maybe this is a final remark, but um, you know, we can't underestimate human creativity and ability to find um, solutions and to also frankly survive and, and adapt to sometimes seemingly impossible circumstances. So we need to bear that in mind when we think about uh, migratory responses, uh, ability to live in places where temperatures are getting increasingly extreme, uh, flood responses. Um, we have a lot of inventive capabilities and adaptive capabilities. And so to end more, maybe on a positive note, I think we have to, to be, um, somewhat optimistic that humans will will you know adjust and adapt 
Uh, but we really need to make sure that those who are well off and have the means uh, contribute and help to help those who don't have the means. That the vulnerable are going to, you know, as Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. We need to be aware that the vulnerable will always be with us, and we need to actually contribute and help those who who are really at a disadvantage. So I'll stop with that. Yeah, that's maybe a good point to to end on. Uh, you know, we. Uh, uh, the international communities has signed on to leaving no one behind. And, and this is a key case where there are people we can identify as vulnerable and who, uh, you know, we all now have to adapt. I don't think uh, the world can avoid adaptation everywhere. And um, that means we need to make sure that everyone can adapt. So uh, let me uh, wrap up. Um, uh, yes, as uh, I'm just reading the comment, uh, we only covered uh, a subset of all the potential climate impacts. Uh, uh, you know, this is a, a really a broad and uh, challenging problem to say the least. Uh, there's a lot of interactions between uh, the different climate hazards, uh, the exposure issues, as we said, feedbacks and interactions, and the vulnerability. It's it's hard to separate, but uh, I think, as someone said earlier, as as scientists, we want to try to, uh, you know, understand the components and 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 uh, uh, make data available so people can do analysis and uh, come to uh, or develop solutions and come to agreement on what needs to be done. Uh, so let me just also finally thank everyone for joining. I, I do want to thank Adrian Kenyon, who is hiding behind the Climate School events uh, box on your screen. But thank you, Adrian. She's been helping with the questions and our, our flow. Uh, we also had help from uh, Elizabeth Sidor from Season uh, pulling this together kind of at the last minute. And uh, we appreciate the support from uh climate uh climate week new york city and uh, uh the climate school uh, which co-sponsored it and uh i just like to thank uh my uh colleagues uh alex carolyn and cascade and all of you for sticking through i think at least half the audience has, is still around but hope you have a uh enjoy the rest of climate uh week new york and thanks for joining us Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Cheers. Thank you.